So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this Eurodos webinar. We took a short, well, a bit longer summer break, but we are back now with the webinars from Eurodos. And approximately from now on every month, you will get a new webinar. We start today with a webinar on the Podium project. Podium stands for Personal Online Dosimetry Using Computational Methods. It was not a real Eurodos uh, only project but uh, it's very linked to personal dosimetry and most of the partners were from Eurodos so that's why we thought it fitted for this Eurodos webinar. So the schedule for today is that I will start with a very short introduction of what is Podium, what is the general setup. Um, after that I will hand the floor to Maria Morduc. Uh, she will talk about fast Monte Carlo methods for interventional radiology. Uh, we continue in the medical field with uh, Una O'Connor, who will explain the application of podium in interventional radiology and interventional uh, radiology. And uh, after that, we switch to the neutrons, where the podium approach will be explained by John Eakins. Um, we will have at the end also uh, time for discussion and questions. So if you have questions, you can type them in the Q&A. Uh, chat and we have also a public chat but that's for more for general remarks so all questions please type them in the Q&A and we will handle all questions at the end so after all presentations okay so let's start about uh, podium why why did we set it up some some uh, years ago well every I think most of you well many of the people here uh, online are somehow uh, linked with personal dosimetry or at least dosimetry measurements. So everybody, uh, uh, many people who work with ionizing radiation need to wear an individual uh, dose meter. And there are some problems with it because many people don't like to wear this dose meter. Uh, if you have to wear more than one, like also a ring or an eye lens or whatever, uh, that's also something workers don't really like to wear more than one dose meter. And even if you put like three, four or five dose meters on the body, you still don't cover all parts of the body. Uh, so you will always have point measurements and you will have limited information. Um, also, as you all know, uh, people forget to wear the dose meter. They lose the dose meter. They don't put it at the correct place. So there is, uh, yeah, not always a strict use of these dose meters. And next to that, there's also a large uncertainty in personal dosimeters. So you see here the, the well-known trumpet curve where we see that we we think we do a good job in dosimetry if we measure within a factor of 1.5 or even 2. So some years ago, we were thinking, uh, what could be the future? How could we improve drastically? Uh, can, can we not dosimetry? Can we not find some new ideas to, to, to see how personal dosimetry might look uh, in the future? And then we thought like, okay, suppose uh, all the, the new developments and, and Monte Carlo simulations, which go faster and faster, what if we at a certain point could use this Monte Carlo simulations to calculate the personal doses? And maybe at a certain point in time, they will go so fast that we can even calculate them on, online. So then maybe we would not need any physical dose meters anymore. So that was just an idea at the time. We were not sure that it was really feasible. But just the thought of, of doing it like this, would yeah, that would bring a lot of advantage. Just, okay, you don't need the physical dose meters anymore. You would not lose it anymore. Um, you don't have the problem with all these changing quantities, weighting factors. Uh, you don't need the operational quantities anymore. In principle, you simulate uh, immediately the effective dose or any organ dose that you want. Uh, you, you're not limited to, to certain organ doses. You can choose which organ doses to calculate can go towards personalized dosimetry for a small person, a big person, a man, woman. All this can be taken into account. So you, you could, in fact, get better accuracy. And if you do it online, you can have faster feedback to the workers. So we had this idea, and we submitted this to this uh, Euratom call from the concert project. And we got successful. So we got uh, like a feasibility study. So we got funding for feasibility. We could not develop the whole podium approach, of course. Uh, but we had two years to, to, to do something. And we were seven partners. You see them here, SEK, where I'm coming from and uh, UPC from Spain, HM Helmholtz Center from Germany, Lund University from Sweden, PHE, which has now changed names a few times since then, uh, the Greek Atomic Energy Commission, and St. James Hospital from Ireland. 
So the goal was to improve occupational dosimetry by seeing if we can make an online dosimetry application using computer simulations or without the use of physical dose meters. And we would try to apply this methodology for two situations where we thought the improvements for dosimetry were urgently needed. So we had neutron workplace fields and uh, interventional radiology. So what do we try to do? Well, we try to use different advanced technologies. So you have Monte Carlo simulations and, and fast Monte Carlo simulations, so the parallel CPU-GPU computing. Uh, we would use computer vision, so, so cameras uh, to, to, to visualize and to, to track the persons, the workers, during their uh, activities. We would use uh, modern newer human computational models, which are flexible, and introduce also machine learning into this. So, so this was a bit the setup that we made, uh, that we wanted to test in Podium. So we had motion tracking input. Uh, so we, we tried to track the, the, the movement and the, and the position of the staff. Uh, we had the radiation source input, which was not uh, new, and the geometry input. And all this should go together in those calculation and give the dose. And preferably, we would try to do this online. So the staff motion tracking, we started using um, the single depth camera, uh, the Kinect from, from, uh, from Microsoft, which was used in the gaming. And we saw that we could really track skeletons of people uh, working. And these XYZ coordinates from 26 points on the person could be sent to a cloud and could be stored. So we could actually, we managed to show that this worked and that we could really track all the movements from a person. And we could also link this to this uh, realistic anthropomorphic flexible phantom that was developed in our institute. So we have this uh, phantom which could, with internal organs, and this is flexible. You could actually couple this to the movements that you see from the Kinect. So you, you could actually make the phantom do exactly uh, like the worker was doing. And, uh, and what follows next, you will hear from, from the next speakers. So uh, I can already tell you that we were successful and I think we, we managed to really show that this podium approach is feasible uh, and you will see more details in the, in the next presentation. So after two years with this team, uh, we managed to get a, a good result, I think. And so the podium project finished in 2020, but the different partners and, and especially also in our institute, we continued working on this approach. We actually also uh, have a PhD now working on applying this to uh, nuclear medicine staff. Um, just don't, I just want to show you a little bit of what we're working because that's a little bit different and you have to try to monitor the hands uh, and not only monitor the hands, but we want to actually track uh, syringes, track, um, track files. So we start using uh, computer vision to, to uh, uh, algorithms to recognize from, from normal camera images, uh, the things that we need to know to calculate the dose. Um, so the next uh, application, so another application where we try it is also, for instance, in decommissioning, where we have a LARA planning and training tool that we try to develop. And again, just to uh, make you enthusiastic and to make you stay for the rest of the webinar, I can show you one more video uh, of what we are working on now, basically. So this is like a storage facility. And you see, just with a normal camera, which, which reaches uh, many meters, we can actually track a person during activities in this storage facility. And like this, we can make the Phantom do exactly the same and do calculations. So as I said, this was just uh, an introduction and you will get more information now. First of all, uh, on the fast simulation code, so how to improve the speed from the simulations. So I would like to invite Maria Mor uh, uh, from UPC to give the next presentation. Hello, good afternoon to everybody. As uh, Philippe has said, my name is Maria Amorduk. I am working at the Universitat Politecnica de Catalunya, and I'm going to talk about uh, fast Monte Carlo methods for the specific domain of interventional radiology or fluoroscopically guided uh, procedures, I mean. In this situation, what we have here, you have a, a typical, a picture of a typical situation in, in, this, in, in this kind of medical procedures. What we have is uh, many staff in the room. As you can see, we can have five, four, five, six person in the same people in the same room. 
in the, the room is full of many complex equipment. And also we have the situation that, of course, the, the medical staff is moving all the time, not too much, but it, it moves and orientates in a different way against the radiation source. And the radiation source is usually a, an X-ray system that changes many times its characteristics, uh, working characteristics during a whole medical procedure. And this happens from a few to a hundred of uh, different irradiation events in which uh, the X-ray system changes uh, primary characteristics such as the kilovoltage peak, angulation, but also the table patients is moving, the collimation, the field sites, and a lot of different parameters are changing during the whole procedure. So from a computational point of view, it's, it's something, something uh, with a high complexity uh, to deal with. So, in particular, we try to solve this problem of occupational dosimetry in this situation with computational methods. And we have to take into account that uh, the Monte Carlo method is, is a method, uh, is a, a stochastic method for numerical integration of the radiation equation of transport. And it means that you, we usually need a large number of particle trajectories to be, uh, to be simulated. And for these specific situations, this means from a few hours to several days per eye radiation event. And if we have hundreds of events and also the individual that has to be monitored moving, this means that our Monte Carlo codes should be adapted to this specific situation. But of course we need uh, uh, fast, Monte Carlo's co fast Monte Carlo codes in such a way the computational times should be as short as possible. So during the, uh, the, the podium project, we develop different uh, solutions with the main goal to keep the simulations around one minute as a much per radiation event. And to do it so, we developed three different uh, codes. One of them based on pre-calculated data for typical irradiation conditions. And this means, of course, that we have to look at these typical conditions and also have a lot of previous simulations ready to be used for any further uh, calculation. Another possibility was to use a standard Monte Carlo code such as Penelope, but using as much variance reduction techniques as, as much simplifications as possible to reduce the computational time. But the third option, and this is the one that I'm going to talk about more is to develop, to use a specific Monte Carlo code adapted to this specific domain, to interventional radiology. Which is this uh, MCGPUR, which is the Monte Carlo code, the fast Monte Carlo code adapted to interventional radiology. Well, this, this code is based on MCGPU. This MCGPU was developed by Andreu Badal at the Food and Drug Administration of the United States many years ago. It's written in, in CUDA and runs on GPUs. It means that they can, this, the system can uh, calculate things in, in a very fast way. But in principle, this code is uh, de designed to provide uh, synthetic images for radiology and computed tomography. So during the podium project, we developed what we called the MCGPU IR, which means that it has, it has been adapted to interventional radiology. And specifically, we included the option to get the, the staff to, to have the staff doses together with an online application. About this online application, Una will talk about in, in the next presentation. So MCGPU plus this online application, this web online application, we get the, the staff doses. And afterwards, we also developed and presented by MCGPU IR, which is a a different code in that case is a standalone code. We don't, uh, we don't need anymore this web online application. And it provides not only staff doses, but also the patient doses. So as I've mentioned, this code is written in, in CUDA, which is a, a programming language for NVIDIA uh, GPUs and is a massively uh, parallelized uh, code. It means because we are trying or aiming to uh, 
to get uh, the maximum speed from using GPUs. And in each GPU, we have around 3,000 CUDA cores. It means that the parallelization is, is very huge. We tested uh, MCGPR in different conditions against a uh, standard code such as Penelope, also against experimental measurements in static conditions and also in real procedures. And what we call PyMCGPU is just a, a wrapper for uh, MCGPUI just to, to do the whole process in, in the most uh, automatic way as possible. So as the basic characteristics of MCGPUI, we have that uh, it simulates X-ray beams with a pyramidal shape. And this shape and size are defined at the image detector plane. And it runs on vexelized uh, geometries. It allows the implementation of MPI libraries. And also, it sets the, the optimal values of different, uh, of different values that we need to, to be run uh, a simulation in a GPU. As a result, we have the values, the dose values for the patient, but of course in, in, in this presentation, especially for the staff, we get, as you can see in the image, the dose at uh, voxel level, also organ doses. And for comparison with experimental values, we also provide uh, the personal equivalent dose, because of course, uh, when we try to compare with <coughs> experimental measurements, what we have is the result of uh, physical dose meters that provide HP10 or HP07. As regards of this, of this system, of this Monte Carlo code, we should keep in mind that it is adapted to interventional radiology. It means that it gets from the radiation dose structure report that it is generated for each medical procedure for a specific patient. Uh, all the required information regarding the X-ray system, but also about the patient. And also combines the information from the tracking system, which is based on Kinect cameras, to, uh, to know the, the exact location of the individual that has to be monitored. So, for instance, what is the information that we need uh, regarding the the working conditions of the X-ray system, we need to know the kilovoltage peak, filtration, field shape, isocenter position, table positions, and so on. And specifically from the patient, we need to know some basic information such as the gender, and also height, weight, weight and the anatomical region examined. MCGPO IR, uh, runs on voxelized geometries, and is, is in particular, we use Rex and Regina from the AGMU. These phantoms are voxelized, I mean, it's, they are not mesh phantoms, but they can be adjusted using three scaling factors in, in, different, uh, in different dimensions, in such a way that with the height and the weight of the patient, we can calculate the body mass index, and with this body mass index, we can scale the perimeter of the voxel phantom in the region of, uh, of interest. What else? From the point of view of the tracking system, what MCGPU needs is the position of different joints of the individual that has to be monitored. So it takes from the system based on Kinect cameras, the different joints, and in particular, the position is calculated from the hip lo location, and shoulders and head are used to determine any possible rotations or bending of the worker. But of course, we have to match in time the air radiation events and the position of the, of the monitored worker, so MCGPUR do does this uh, matching and to do it so all clocks of, of all PCs of course should be absolutely as synchronized to the greatest possible degree of accuracy that it means we need at least uh, an accuracy of one second because most of medical x-ray systems provide results in each uh, each second and at the end just because we don't have so much time just a bit of of results of static 
cases. I mean, without using the tracking camera system, because this is going to be presented by, by Yuna in the next presentation. As I've already mentioned, we tested MC2PR in a static test in our own uh, secondary calibration facility, as you can see with regular phantoms, but also in realistic conditions, in that case in, in the Malmo hospital with anthropomorphic phantoms now. And as a summary of conclusions, I can say that the results were considered satisfactory for the purpose of podium because the simulation times, if we talk about organ doses that involve a lot of, of, of voxels, can be calculated in a few seconds per air radiation event. When we talk about HP10, the personal equivalent dose, we are talking about a very few number of, uh, of voxels can be calculated in, in some tens of seconds. For instance, around 60 seconds to get results with an uncertainty quite low, below 2.6% for K equal to two. So very, very, very short. And this using an old cluster because we don't have a, a very huge cluster with a lot of GPUs and a lot of different uh, systems adapted only for this. So even these times can be shorter if you, we use a, a modern platform. And as regards the comparison of the results with measurements and also with the standard simulations, the situation is that MC, MCGPR tends to underestimate HP10 around up to 20% when compared with a full simulation with, for instance, Penelope Co, or against experimental values. As I've mentioned, we developed two different additional codes, but in that cases, we observed that they tend to overestimate doses, but once again, around up to this 20, 25%. So we think that the results were pretty good even taking into account all the simplifications we had to, to do in the different solutions. And from my side, this is all that I wanted to say because now Una will talk about the application in the realistic conditions. Thank you for your attention. And, and as Philip has told, uh, questions at the end of the webinar. Thank you very much. I give the floor to, to Una. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Magyama. So I see we have already some questions, but I said we will um, treat them at the end. So I think Una is ready now for her part. Okay. Yes, right. thanks very much. Well, good afternoon to everybody. And thanks for the uh, invite to speak at the webinar today. Um, what I'm going to just do now is just follow on from the nice introductions, just to talk about the particular work package that I was involved in, work package four. Um, looking at the application of podium in the hospital setting in interventional radiology and cardiology. So this has already been uh, mentioned in, in the introduction by Philip, but particularly in relation to the hospital setting, like what, what would be our motivation to improve things um, and look at more innovative approaches to personal dosimetry? Well, we do have difficulties with um, positioning errors, with staff wearing their, their dosimeters, um, compliance with wearing at times, the time as well it takes to receive the dose readings. So passive dosimeter is being worn for a month um, and being returned for a reading and then getting the result after that time. Um, the management of very large numbers of staff, if you're in a, a busy, big teaching hospital and the costs associated with lost dosimeters, for example. Um, we would tend to see then the number of badges that we are issuing to people increasing over time. Um, particularly with the addition of um, eye dosimeters in recent years and some fingers, finger dosimeters for certain staff. So this is some of our motivation as well to be involved. And Work Package 4 then looked at the feasibility of applying podium in the clinical setting. So what were the aims of that work package? Well, we were asked to look at experiments in the clinic using phantoms to test the application of podium during real clinical interventions and to explore overall hospital usability. So part one was actually carried out in Malmo um, as part of um, the work done by Lund University. So I'm just going to present just th three slides on their behalf just showing the work that they, they did at the beginning of um, the work package. So first of all, it was to just look at a test of the motion tracking system. So all of this was done about tra basically trying to get the Connect camera installed in the hospital 
connected to a PC, you know, functioning um, successfully and doing some calibration measurements as well, just making sure that the measurements are accurate from the connect. So a lot of work was done there in Malmo at the beginning, just phantom studies. And then they moved on to doing a very nice piece of work um, with one of their interventional doctors who very kindly agreed to participate and um, for his photo to be used as well. Um, so they did a very nice piece of work with um, using active dosimeters. The, the, the doctor wore a series of active dosimeters over his lead apron and 35 um, salt pellets as radiation detectors positioned in a, in a map basically over his body while he was doing a renal artery angiogram. And then the, after the, the case was simulated as well to make to look at a comparison between the measured and the simulated doses. And they got this so very nice set of results showing a heat map of his dose from the salt pellets and then some measurements from the Mirian um, active dosimeter as well. And we can see then at certain points, for example, just if we pick out um, one or two of them, we can see that where um, in the midpoint of his abdomen where the dose was measured by the Mirian to be 30 microsieverts, it was simulated to be about 37 microsieverts. And this was published recently then by um, Anya Alman and the, the team in Sweden um, in radiation protection dosimetry. So the work then in St. James's, then we moved on. Um, the, in Malmo, obviously, they did, they did also do part two, the uh, test the application during clinical interventions. And we did the same in St. James's. And we looked in good detail then at the hospital usability. So it was mentioned by Maria Moore that really the, the RGSR, so the radiation dose structured report from the interventional X-ray system is a really key part of Podium. Um, so one of the first things that we had to do then if we were looking at setting it up in St. James's and which rooms to use and where to locate the cameras. Um, in terms of which rooms to use, we, it was decided that we would do it in, in, two, in two rooms to get some breadth of experience across um, some different clinical settings. So we were going to install the equipment and track cases in an endovascular interventional room with a Siemens Artis Q system that was four years old and it had a radiation, it had quite easy and quick um, access to a radiation dose structured report already. So that was okay and ready to use in terms of the dose report. But in our second room, which is the interventional cardiology room, um, it was just a slightly older system, but it didn't, it didn't have, it had an RGSR um, capability, but it wasn't easy for us to access it, but we were able to get that installed and the software capabilities to access the RGSR um, as part of the podium project. So there are the two rooms that were used and there was you know, various series of discussions made about where the best place was to install um, the camera in those two rooms. So if I just give you one example of what would happen then when we were tracking a cardiac case or a cardiac case number one. So what we wanted to measure was the HP10 from the main operator. He was wearing um, an APD over his lead apron, positioned slightly on the right side, and he was carrying out a percutaneous current cardiac intervention or PCI procedure. And we would have been present in the room during the case and setting up the connect and getting things started for him and then making some observations while the case was ongoing. And after the case was completed, then we would um, go and prepare a data, data set for the simulation team. So we would have a series of files with the operator's position per second, the, the cameras, all of the, the clocks were synchronized, as Marie Moore said. Then we'd have the dose report from the Philips DoseWise system, and then a series of our observations from being in the room. We anonymized the dose reports and um, cleaned the files and validated them and shared them then be a secure file manager with the simulation team and they ran the, the simulation using various codes. So I'll just hopefully be able to show you a video, which is really short, just what it looks like when you're running the Connect camera in the room and what you can see. So you can just see again, hopefully you can see the sort of skeleton tracking that took place. So the tracking is picking up four members of staff that are in there, the room there. There can be quite a lot of people in the room. Um, Again, with the teaching taking place and different things. So that's the sort of uh, image that you would see from, um, just go back to my slides. That's the type of image that you would see then from the connect. So no persons were identifiable from it, of course, it was just the skeleton tracking, which is important. 
So for the first, we did track, we, we tried to track quite a lot of cases and obviously you learn quite a lot from going through the different cases and some of them worked out well and others didn't. But when we were finished the first few cases, we had to do an awful lot of manual preparation files to basically try and kind of pull out the main operator because he, he could have, he could be assigned a different skeleton tracking um, ID as he moved around the room and it could be, there was some difficulties just in tracking the main operator. Um, so there's a lot of time on that, on that aspect at the start. And then our colleagues in SCK developed a nice Python algorithm to try and filter through the, the Connect basically prepared six skeleton tracking files. Um, so they prepared a faster way to try and find the main operator because of the problems that we had fed back. And then I'll just show you then some, an, a sample of our results um, from the measured versus simulated staff dose from some of these cases. So just if you look at the first case that I show here, which is an end of ask, in the end of vascular room, which is an angioplasty case. So we have the DAP for the patient exam, the EPD or APD measured dose in HP10 of 55 microsieverts. And then you can see the comparison for this, the simulation using three different Monte Carlo codes. And broadly speaking, there's about a 40% difference between what we measured and simulated. If you look then at um, two of the cardiac cases in the other room, which are next, um, so for the first cardiac case, we measured 31 microsieverts for the um, operator, but you can see then there is some more of a difference in this case um, between, between the three codes and in comparison to the measured value as well. And then if we look at the third case, we can see that we had measured 16 microsieverts on the EPD. And again, in some, for some of the codes, there's quite good agreement and a little bit more of a difference in other cases. Um, and particularly with the cardiac cases, one of, one of the, the difficulties um, that we would have encountered was that it was, it was very difficult to track the use of the ceiling mounted screen. So the operators will be encouraged for good radiation protection practice to use a ceiling mounted screen, but it's not easily visible or trackable on the Connect camera system. Um, so that's just one of the aspects that need to be work we need to continue on in that. So, so some of the challenges that we found from, from the work done in St. James is what it, it, it most definitely is a complex multi-vendor environment. So it was hard to find the best location for the camera, the cables, the PC. We had to make sure our electrical safety and all of the installation was okay. And um, the IT performance then on the PC, um, just making sure it was capable of, of dealing with very large files and large video tracking files. We very carefully went through our um, ethics committee and did uh, consent for all of the staff and patient participants, particularly because there's that, that element, I suppose, of, of Big Brother with a camera in the room that we just needed to take care of and reassuring and, and showing people obviously clearly that nobody was identifiable, so we didn't need to use um, um, real images, but um, nonetheless, we had uh, consent forms completed for all of the cases and we needed to be present in the room and to record quite a lot of observations particularly in the early days we would have had some low dose cases which is again ni nice from radiation protection point of view but if it didn't record very much on the on the apd they were they were difficult then to simulate and we definitely would have had some occlusions as the c arm moved around the room as people stood in front of each other and you can see some examples where the skeleton tracking wouldn't have um you know, wouldn't have worked so well at times um, when there's occlusions in a, in a really busy room. And you can just see again, just in a, a slightly bigger version of the image, what again may happen. So in the first image there on the left, you can see that there's two operators working very close side by side. Um, one of them would have been what we would have called the main operator, but they certainly would have been very closely assisted by the second operator. Again, as I said, in a, in a teaching hospital, this would happen quite a lot. So the role of the main operator wasn't actually always you know, very easy to identify because they would um, swap places and take turns um, depending on the complexity of the case. One person might start and they might get some more assistance finishing. And physically, they work quite close together as well. So you can see in the second picture what happens when the skeleton gets a little bit confused. And instead of separating out two skeletons, you have one combined um, skeleton that's not as well tracked. So um, what we would ideally like to get to then in the end is to have this online um, interface where we can have something in the clinic where we can in real time or at the end of the case see the staff doses. So as part of Podium then in the work package three, um, some work was done on a, the, the, you know, the, the front end and the interface of the, 
the solution that we might use in the clinic and we were asked to run some trials on this as well so what you might see then if the you know the the project was live and, and up and running as a full completed project and um, you could log in as a radiation protection expert for example and you could review staff doses or you could log in as an operator and you could start the monitoring for the case and then at the end when it's finished you would get something like the the, the second image which would show that for the SJH cardiac number one procedure, which is a PCI in this particular room, um, the operator got a HP10 value of such an amount. And they also, we also would be able to calculate then their HP3, HP007. So this would be the sort of nice end point to get to in terms of real time online doses that doctors, radiation protection experts, the radiographers in the room, you know, people could log in and access these in real time. So just coming towards the end, I said we were asked to comment on overall hospital usability. So the recommendations that we would have made after our experience with Podium um, was that the solution, because the room is, is complex and busy and has lots of equipment in it, um, the, the, final, you know, the, the product should be really integrated and wireless and safe for the clinical environment. It should have very automated and reliable tracking of the main operator and automated tracking of the ceiling lead screen and the CR. Um, we would have to say what the minimal technical requirements are for the X-ray system, because if it doesn't have an, an RDSR um, capability, if it's, if it's too old, let's say for that, or it's not easily accessible, um, we won't be able to, to, to simulate the doses. So having some more links with the vendors um, and standards bodies to work towards this would, would be good and also giving um stating what the minimal technical requirements are for the it solution so that you can be sure it's it's, it's going to work well and fast and reliable you, you know you would need a user manual and um, really need to consider the privacy and, and the ethics and the data protection aspects for example but that it, it certainly should continue um you know the work was was really was really valuable and with some some further validation in the clinical setting um would be very valued so we did, we definitely found that it was feasible to simulate doses and this was done on live cases in a complex clinical setting. So the concept definitely has mer merit and I have to say it was really very welcomed by clinical staff. So so any um, of the clinical staff that we approached about it, they were they were very, very interested in, you know, looking forward to a time where they could and the, that they might not have to wear um, all of these individual dose meters. So they really just want to know when when is it happening. Um, so it can overcome the limitations of physical dose meters and we did this um, ambitious um, proof of concept over a short period and it would need another future stage of development but there's definitely potential there and some of the results then from um, the work in St James's was just recently published in the Journal of Radiological Protection. And this is our team meeting in Dublin from a few years ago so I'll just finish up there and say thanks for your attention and if there's any questions at the end I'd be very happy to take them. Okay, thank you very much, Una. So the questions are coming in, so please continue writing the questions and we will answer them at the end. So after uh, medical settings, we switch now to uh, applying the podium approach in neutron exposure. So I give the floor to John. Okay, thank you, Philippe. So I'll start, I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, please shout if you can't. The motivation, the approach for, for neutrons is, or the introduction really has already been given as we know there are already many problems associated with single point of do test dose meters and so well could we use computational methods instead and we've got a similar approach for neutrons as we have for, for photons so the overall idea is that we use uh, Monte Carlo's computer simulations to determine effective dose rates we then track people as they move around in the field using various cameras and we combine those technologies together to provide real-time estimates of doses Actually, one could argue that the advantages in a in a neutron workplace are, you know, to some extent, even 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 greater than in photons because neutron dose meters often perform far worse. So I've just shown a plot here on the on the right of a bunch of different types of dose meter in a bunch of different types of real workplace neutron fields, and we see in some cases order of magnitude or two order of magnitude over or under responses. So you know, there's a real incentive to do something with neutrons. Many of the challenges that uh, that exist for photons also exist for neutrons. I had a best how best to map fields or track individuals and, and and so on. But there are significant differences when we when we move to, to neutrons. Some of these are good. So, for example, for neutrons, the radiation fields and the shielding tends to be a little bit more homogeneous. 
Uh, we're also not so worried about extremity doses and micro micro movements. So the video that, that Philippe showed of someone's hand moving around isn't so much an issue for, for, for neutron fields. On the other hand, we do have disadvantages. So we tend to have mixed fields, so mixed neutron gamma fields. We have very wide energy ranges, so maybe nine, 10 orders of magnitude energy ranges. The radiation sources may be unknown, and we have much larger geometries. So, you know, for example, a, a reactor, a reactor hole. So the question was how best to perform dissymmetry in mixed neutron gamma fields. And as with the rest of the podium, the idea is that we create some form of Monte Carlo model of, of our exposure scenario and calculate doses to individuals move within it. So the perfect solution might be to, to render our, 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 neutrons, our neutron environment here into a Monte Carlo model and then put in a person and calculate the dose that way. And this course will give the correct estimate of risk and it would give the correct field perturbation by the phantom. But unfortunately, it's for, or for various reasons, given the, the size of the, the, the field and the size of the energies, it's very difficult to, to, to manipulate this kind of input file in Monte Carlo and, and run computation to symmetry in real time in, in practice. And in principle, it's also very hard to assign the correct radiation weighting factor when we have neutrons. So really, we could only come with this approach in, in, uh, in the monogetic field. So, OK, we had to abandon that idea. So and instead, our, the approach we used was to pre-calculate out field maps. So in other words, we mapped the field discreetly in locational angle. So we defined a, a spatial XY grid of points at our, at our facility. We determine the fluence energy distribution of neutrons and photons at each point in that grid as a function of angle. We then convolve that with effective dose per fluence conversion coefficient data and come up with our field map that way. And then the idea is that as the individual moves around the field, as they move around the facility, they would snap their position to the, the, the nearest, the closest available point on that grid and use the, the angle and then the XY uh, data from the tracking software with that field map. OK, actually, even there we have a, have a bit of a problem because the data we have for uh, fluence effective dose conversion coefficients are only for standardized exposing additions. And so ICRP 116, we have data for plane parallel fields and isotropic and rotation fields. But of course, real fields don't, real fields don't conform to this. Real fields look like, like something here on the, on the right. We have a range of different directions and a range of different energies and a range of different strengths of field come from different directions. So we can directly use these these standardized exposure conditions, these standardized uh, conversion coefficients. So instead, we decided to approximate the real field, so this field on the on the left, as a as a linear sum of plane parallel components. So in other words, we broke this, this, uh, this, this complicated field down into a component coming from the front plus and a component coming from 45 degrees and a component coming from the right and and, and so on. And so the, the real field of that, of that field is then the linear sum of those different components. So within this proof of concept, uh, we convolved into, deconvolved into eight horizontal such components. So to do that, at each point we defined, on our, each point on our, on, our, on our grid, we defined a cone. So in this case, within our Monte Carlo, when I calculation, we define a cone, and the idea is that each cone sort of sucks in or picks out uh, the component of the field coming from that given direction. So the one here the facing upwards, it, it, it's, it's, it, it's sucking in, it, it's telling this direction of the field. And then if we rotate the cone, we then get you know, this component of the field over, over here. And then if we can convolve those with relevant conversion coefficients, so we convolve the one at the front with AP conversion coefficients, we get the AP-like contribution to dose. Uh, likewise, the one on the on on the right is the R lat contribution to dose, and similarly for the ones from from the rear and and for left lat and the other angles. So that's the idea. We can we can evolve it with those standard conversion coefficients. Actually, even here we have an additional problem that uh, the data conversion coefficient data at intermediate angles is not provided in in ICRP one one six. So as part of this project, my my, my colleague Yang Anson calculated at these intermediate angles for monoenergetic plane parallel fields. Of course, also we need to worry about non-horizontal planes as well. So we also need to change the axis of these cones to tally the fluence in different directions. So in, in you know, semi-superior isotropic on the top, for example, or in different angles. So angles pointing up and down, and you know, we'll, we'll sort of see more of this later on. But the important thing being that the full four pi solid angle at any given point on the grid has been has been accounted for. Okay, so I'll summarize our, our recipe. So we're going to use Monte Carlo to calculate the fluence in using different cones in different angles in the horizontal plane and in the and in the non-horizontal 
non-horizontal plane. We're going to convolve those with Talia multipliers to give the various angular components effective dose. We normalize to give the full four pi fluence field, and then we scale those results by the source activity and sum to give the effective dose rates. So that's that's the that's the idea. Actually, if we're characterizing the, the fluence energy field, we can actually swap out our effective dose rates, uh, our effective dose conversion coefficients uh, for H star 10 conversion coefficients and come up with the ambience dose equivalent rate within the field as well. And this is useful. It's useful as a check. Uh, of course, effective dose isn't measurable, but H star 10 is. So we can put survey instruments in the field to come up with confir confirmatory measurements to, to uh, to, to, to make sure we, we're on the right track, we can use it to provide scaling factors. I think there's a question in the in, in, in the in the in the chat about unexpected events. Scaling factors can do this. We can measure it and we can sort of scale our results accordingly. And we can use it as an alarm, for example. So there, there's advantages for, for HR10 as well. Okay, so that's the theory. Of course, it's important to test it, and we tested it by building a very simple uh, simulated workplace field in our neutron laboratory. So this here on the on the, on, the, on the left is the, the secondary standard neutron field in, in UKHSA, and we have here behind this, this lead shield an ambi source. We then introduced the water tanks behind that ambi source in order to moderate the field. And by putting this into the, the Monte Carlo model, so the, the, the figure in the, in, in the center, we're able to produce fluence energy distributions at a point of test a meter behind the water that look like those from real workplace fields. So we're comparing here the green, our simulated test, with fields from the Ebedos project. And the field is called strongly angle and, and location dependent. So as individuals, as we move away from this central axis, the, the angle and the, and the, the, the energy dependence of, of the field will change. So this, of course, makes it a very useful test within the, the context of, of what we want for podium. OK, so this was our, our Monte Carlo and MCMP model. So we're looking down now from you know, as, a, as a plan view, and we define an XY grid within our facility. So I'll I'll zoom in a little on just one of those. So we have here the, the ambi source, we have the, the the water tanks in front of it, and then on this one by one meter grid, we define various different tallying points, and we define cones on those tallying points in order to characterize the fluence energy distribution of the field, which we then of course convolve with the effective dose conversion coefficients that we've, we've already mentioned. And this gives us a whole family of effective dose rates because, of course, effective dose rate, effective dose will depend on the direction in which the individual is facing. As they rotate in the field, so too will the effective dose to which they're being uh, being exposed to. So in this case, we have eight different directions individual, a family of eight different uh, effective dose rates that is, that is appropriate for them. If we just focus on one of them, we see this is the, the, the simulated data, and it does what we'd expect. So down here, when an individual is 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 facing the unmoderated field, they get a pretty high dose. And as they to move round here and they get a, a left lateral exposure, it, it goes down. And as they move further around here, now they're behind, now they're, they're getting an AP exposure and they're behind the water rate, the water moderators, so their, their dose rate drops down. And of course, right up here in the corner of the room, which is you know, corresponding to over here somewhere, the dose rate is, is much, much lower. As I said, we can uh, just as easily calculate H star 10 rates in the same field, just by switching the, the, the conversion coefficients within the, within the Monte Carlo uh, model. And we're able to produce an equivalent H star 10 map for the facility. And this is useful because we can then measure these using a range of different neutron survey instruments. So I've shown here on the, on the graph uh, a plot of the ratio between the Monte Carlo and the measured data. And we see that, OK, there, there are a couple of outliers in place, not, so, not quite so good. But generally, almost all the results agreed with Monte Carlo and measurement to within sort of plus or minus 20% or so. So this indicates quite a success, I think, for the model, given all the parameters that are in there. That this, this indicates quite a success for the proof of concept. As an interesting aside, we also know that this is a field where H star 10 underestimates protection quantity. So this is another this is another case where the, where the, the operational dose quantity is uh, is not conservative of the, the actual risk to the individuals, which once again highlights the potential advantage of, of something like a podium approach that we, we can we can avoid perhaps on the occupational quantities, operational quantities. Okay, so uh, with the field map derived from the Monte Carlo, we're able to, to test it, we're able to put somebody in the field. So we, we set up the connect camera in the laboratory to attract the people. So we can see over here that, you know, the water tanks over here and, and, and the camera or you know, the field here and the, and the 
uh, the Connect camera over here. So, so this is over here in the, in the bottom bottom right. This is what the camera is seeing. So we can imagine as an individual moves around within this field, uh, it'll it should be able to track them. So I shall endeavour to show a video of that. So we showed a. Uh, So we tracked my my colleague for a, a minute or so as she walked around it. And as, as as each second passes, the camera tracks where she is as, as an X Y position, and also by tracking the the position of her shoulders, it's looking at the the orientation, the angle at which she's she's facing. Okay, so I just search that. Okay, so to, to back to it. So, so this, yeah, this is the idea. So, as the person moves around, and we can see superimposed on the floor, uh, we have these one by one meter grid points that uh, that is being snapped at each time. So, by combining this tracking data with our with our dose rate maps, we're able to come up with the effective dose that that was experienced during that as she as she walked around. So, it looks like some of this. So, this is the result simply from a one minute test, and we see on the top left. Uh, where she was at each second snapshot of of, the, of this passage, she walked around the lab. This is where she was in X Y location. So those those positions in this in this sort of graph at the top, they would have been snapped to the nearest one nearest point on the one by one meter grid. We would then use the effective dose rate data, plus you know this whole sort of family of of of, of, of eight different graphs depending on the orientation which she was facing at the time, to then give the effective dose rate that. Uh, that was being experienced at each second and of course by integrating that over over the minute we're able to come up with the total accumulated dose on the bottom on the bottom right here so it was kind of like 60 microsieverts an hour so it's like a microsievert in in one minute so you know, that was quite a success okay of course that was a, a very contrived scenario you know this is in a secondary standard laboratory so it's useful also to expand that to consider a slightly more realistic workplace scenario and so in, in order to achieve that we tested the approach also in the real workplace field at uh, SEKCN so this features a mox spent fuel flask on a concrete platform and actually this was problematic right from the start because we don't actually know exactly what the source composition is or the geometry is so we know that we have we can see outside we have a concrete platform here and we have these these sort of great metal uh the little pigs inside it with, with the fuel flock and we know that those cylinders are i think we think made of lead and there's fuel tugs somewhere inside it but we're not exactly sure what the source term is so that's an additional challenge on top of that uh individuals could well be standing very close to the source so if individuals are standing here somewhere the direction of the field is, is is going to be coming up towards them and so we need additional ways of, of telling the field so in order to achieve this uh we defined additional cones within our within our telling method so we were able to tally the and de determine the, the dose contributions from angles that are coming up from from the rear on top of that we also considered bending and kneeling individuals as well so we wanted to map at different heights so we made it more complicated and it began to, to reflect the types of exposure that a real would, would happen in a, in a real workplace but of course, the approach was, was was pretty much the same as 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 previously. So we defined our, our Monte Carlo model. So we, we we built a model of of the exposure conditions, and we defined a grid of locations within it. So in this case, we chose a slightly a slightly finer grid, a fifty by fifty centimeter grid, at three different heights. So this corresponding to 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 to, to kneeling, to bending, and, and to standing, and also defined. Uh, a range of, of test points within the field that we could compare our measurements against. And of course, it's very important in this case to, to benchmark against measurements and spectrometry because we didn't exactly know what the field, what the, what the source term was. So first of all, we used bonospheres at the various locations, uh, the, 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 the measurement points to estimate the, the, the field, the, 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 the fluence distribution of the field at each point, which we could then compare against the Monte Carlo model. And by iterating then the source, we were able to come up with something that agreed with those, those measurements. So we see in this plot here, just two of the locations, location A and B, by iterating the source, we're able to, to recreate the real field of that location. Further, we can then test that against H.10 measurements. So we used a range of neutron survey instruments at the various different locations in order to come up with an estimate in the H.10. And we already then compare that with the H.10 calculated by, by the Monte, Monte Carlo model. And we get a mixed set of results. So we see at, at locations B, C, D, E, and G, 
Monte Carlo and and measurements agree well in many cases, but actually not all the survey instruments are agreeing well. So we see the Pasilla is always underestimating. At position A, nothing really agrees with each other. So the, the Monte Carlo is somewhere in the middle of this range, but actually the different neutron survey instruments are not quite agreeing. So again, this is sort of showing some of the difficulties that that is faced not just by podium, but also within within the measurements as well. We also looked at H HP10, so we, we slathered various faces of the phantoms at these different locations with a range of different types of, of neutron dose meters, so both chemically and electrochemically actioned PADC, albedo TOD and EPDs, and also a range of PADC dose meters across the, the front face. And again, I'm showing just, just one, one of these sets of results, but again, we see the same sort of uh, results as, as, as we might expect, that the personal dose meter response varies greatly with type and, and position. So even at a given position, different dose meters not agreeing with the other necessarily, and even within position on, a, on an individual front face, on an individual face of the phantom. So we have here, we have this range of, of results for the same type of dose meter. So of course the position where the, the, the dose meter is worn is, is quite critical for neutron dosimetry. But okay, with at least the, the effective dose rate uh, or the model confirm, we can calculate the effective dose rate to come up with a family of doses. So as before, this is a function, the effective dose rate is a function of, of uh, lateral position X and Y. But of course, now we have three different heights. And so with the, uh, the eight different angles at which an individual might be facing in this field, we have at each point a family of 24 effective dose rates. But that's just, you know, but that's just an additional complexity. It's not, uh, it's, it's not a change to the overall, the overall method. So we're able then to embed that within the work tracking package and come up with a similar estimate as we did in the UKHSA field. So it has, as an individual sort of moves around the, 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 the facility and works and stands and kneels and so on, we're able to track their, their position as an, as an XY, uh, as an XY uh, plot. And of course, this is suppressing two of the, the, the important parameters, so the height and the angle. And that's manifested then in the graph of the cumulative dose. So if we compare the H star 10 with the effective dose, of course, both increase over time, but the H star 10 increases more than the effective dose because of course, effective dose is angle dependent, whereas H star 10 is, is, is nominally conservative. So again, another success hopefully for the approach. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it then to summarize by saying that uh, real-time neutron Monte Carlo is not really yet practical, but we can still estimate doses in this way by using effective dose rate maps and people tracking approaches. And this has been tested successfully uh, as, as a proof of concept at both UKHSA and, and, and SCKCN. We use survey instruments to validate and, and scale the Monte Carlo model. And generally we found good agreements, but some inconsistencies in the measurements have shown up. And this is particularly, particularly evident when we looked at the personal dose meter results also. And this again highlights, you know, leads us towards some of the real power of the Monte Carlo approach, the podium approach. That, that it will allow us to avoid some of the problems associated with dose meters and operational dose quantities. And this is particularly interesting because it chimes perhaps with a more recent focus towards the protection quantities. One thinks of ICRU 95, the, where the operational dose quantities are being based now upon protection quantities within that proposal. Okay, this maybe goes a step further and say, well, do we, you know, do we really need the operational dose quantities in quite such a, you know, in all cases? On top of that, the podium approach is going to count for dose rates well below anything that could be measured by a personal dose meter. So some of the dose rates we, we used here were nano sieverts per second, so well below anything could be measured. So again, this, this shows the real power of it. But this, of course, is just a proof of concept. And the next step is then to, to try and develop this into a, a real world application. So if anybody is, is, is keen on collaborating with us, we'd be very welcome. We're very, very pleased to, to hear from people. So I'll leave it just at that, save just to, to, to say thanks to the, the podium team and our, and our collaborators in our centres and invite any questions along with a entirely shameless uh, plug for the two papers that we've, we've recently published in this work. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, John. So this concludes the, the different talks and I hope we gave uh, the audience a good idea of what we did during the podium project. Uh, let me ask to all speakers to uh, put on their cameras and then I will, we can handle some of the questions that were uh, put in the Q&A. So let me start by a first question for uh, Agia Mor. Um, this was from um, Abdelatif Talbi. How can we optimize the uncertainties related to the calculation of the parameters from the simulation? So of course, this is the, the main issue when you do any simulation. The, the principal way is to 
to do more, to simulate more histories. And you can do it just by parallelization, do, using, for instance, GPUs or a, a huge cluster of CPUs. And of course, depending on the type of Monte Carlo code that you are using, the, the, the strategies are different. For instance, you can uh, set up the different uh, cutoffs of the energies of the particles to be simulated. You can apply uh, variance reduction techniques, for instance, to calculate fluences and then apply conversion factors to get a dose. There are different strategies, I think, that this is what I can see in short. Maybe also the second question is for you. So are there from Shahid Khan, are there any particular reasons why the 20% overestimations uh, is there compared to the MCGPU? So when we compare MCGPU with a full Monte Carlo, then what we can say is that a full simulation starts with the, the trajectory of the particle at the focal spot of the X-ray beam. And in the case of MGGPU IR, uh, the simulation is uh, running two steps. In the first step, uh, we have the simulation of the trajectories in the patient geometry. And when the particles are going to uh, exit this uh, environment or this box of the patient, then with a, an extra uh, ray tracing technique, we look if they are aiming to reach the, the volume where we put the, the operator. And only in that cases, we score these uh, particles in a phase space file and, uh, and then afterwards simulate the doses in the geometry of the operator, the main operator. This could be a possibility because there are some interactions that we, of course, we don't take into account if we have more than one possibility of, of scattering and reaching to, to the position of the operator. This is one possibility. And when we talk about the comparison with experimental values, or which one is the, the, what, the best, I mean, <laughs> it's not a clear answer if Monte Carlo is the right one or the experimental value is the right one, because both have their own limitations. I think that more or less. Yeah, may, maybe related to that is also a question from Jean-Marc Bourdi. When comparing the EPD results and the calculations that you introduced the response curve of the EPD in the calculation, so I think that's a bit answered by you just now. Eh? No, I, I, we, we did not do this. Um, in principle, we could do it, and then we would probably get maybe 10% better accuracy, maybe even 20%, who knows. Uh, but but what, what is the reference? It's, it's not only the energy and the angle, it's also the position of, of the dose meter, which is very important. So no, we, we did not do it because we we just wanted to know that we were on the right track in the, in the right uh yeah, order of magnitude, let's say. Um, maybe another question, um, maybe for Una, it was from Gamal Akabani. Can you establish a database for each room where you can measure in real life the radiation fields versus the position of a staff member and assess his organ dose? Yeah. Um, so thanks for the question. I, I think I think we probably could if we you know tracked a lot of cases and built up. You know a lot more information about the rooms and um, in a way like if some of that would already exist i suppose with um not in real time but we'd have we'd already have isodose maps and isodose curves like maps of the room for the manufacturer and if we knew the position that the staff member is standing in we can um we can calculate their dose but podium hopefully will just bring it to the next level so really let's say rather than just the database just measuring it for each individual staff member as they're in the room and for the, ca the case that they're doing because there's so many complex variables and so many factors and so many different you know x-ray parameters um from the from the x-ray tube and patient variables and small positions and staff member uh, where the staff member stands can make quite a big difference so the idea would just be to, to measure it really in real time for for each staff member, depending on where their position and, and yes, expand it to, to work out their organ doses as well. Okay, thank you. Maybe another one for you from Jennifer Smith. Would ID markers on each person present, one on the front and one on the back at the cross point of spine and shoulders, help the system not to get people confused, uh, especially if, if it's aware how many people it should be identifying? 
Yeah, no, it's, it's a nice question, Jennifer, and like something that we talked about quite a bit during the podium project meetings. And we, we would have tried this at certain points, like wearing ID markers to help identify people. And um, ultimately, when it came to the hospital measurements, what we what we we wanted to really get away from people having to wear anything. So I suppose we wanted to, to try it um, without the markers. So we didn't really it, it could have been a solution for the validation phase only, but we really wanted to say we can do this without somebody having to wear anything. So just we don't want to take away a dosimeter um, and replace it with a, with some sort of a, an ID marker. We did think about this point, yeah. Maybe a last one for you, Una, from Shahid Khan again. Did you see any difference with the monitor placed on the other side of the chest? In cardiac cases, particularly, rotation of the shoulder seems to be significant. Um, yeah, so it would be. I mean, the position on the chest would with wherever the APG is worn would be of significance and um, Shahid in terms of uh, the dose that you would measure. And if I think for the, the example that I pointed out, if the doctor had worn the APG on the left side, we, we probably would have expected the APG dose to be higher all right. But the important thing for the simulation was, but I just had to make sure that wherever the APG was worn, um, the, I fed that back to the simulation team and the dose was simulated at that point so that we were I suppose trying to compare like with like so that they weren't trying to simulate it for a point on the right shoulder but the APG was actually worn on the left shoulder for that case so it was trying to for the validation case it's trying to feed back you, you know how, how it was measured in the clinic and so the the team with the different Monte Carlo simulators because they can pick so many different points on the body and um, they could pick the place closest to the APG okay thank you there's also one question on the neutrons, so I, I hope John can answer this one from Daniele Griffelli, Griffrida. Uh, could you assess the effect on the calculated dose weights of the presence uh, and movements of the operators in the neutron field? I think the answer to that is is yes and no. So the the, the approach we adopted was was estimating the effect of dose rate essentially free in air. You know, it's best to be in a point without the presence of the, of the phantom there because there are various problems of introducing the voxel phantom in, in, in there. So in that sense, the, the proof of concept we did, the, the, the effective dose rates are not accounting for that scatter that might be caused by, by two or three or four additional people. So that sense, you know, we haven't done that. On the other hand, it could be done relatively easy in principle. I think by having a family of effective dose rates. So you could imagine if uh, if there was an individual worker who spent most of the time standing in, in one or two or three different places within the facility, you could build, you could generate an effective dose rate map for each of those different places where they were standing. And so depending on which configuration where, where that person was standing, you then pick which of those effective dose rates uh, was was appropriate. And of course, you can imagine if there are several people in there and the ones at one station, one's at another station, you could come up with an effective dose rate map for those two eventualities as well and see how the scatter of cross works between them. So we didn't do that, but it's not a problem in, in principle. It's just an additional complication in, in, in practice. I make another point as well, actually, that, that and there may be counterexamples to what I'm about to say, but I would have thought in many cases it may not make too much difference because the presence of a second person would more likely not simply scatter the, the neutron field. And if it scatters the neutron field to, you know, towards, towards an additional person, if it scatters the neutron field, it's likely to moderate it, which makes it going to be low in energy where the conversion coefficients are much, much lower. So in principle, it's you know so it's a very valid point but in practice i wonder in many cases whether all you're really doing is changing one thermalized part of the field to another thermalized part of the field and so it may not change the dose rate too much so that's that's my answer we didn't do it but i think it could be done okay <clears throat> there's two questions also on on the camera itself so one and get from daniele is how sensitive is the kinect camera to the radiation exposure um well in principle the, I, i'll try to answer it myself but, in principle, the camera is, of course, uh, all cameras are, are sensitive to radiation. In principle, the camera, the Kinect, is, is never in the direct field in this interventional cases, so it should not matter too much. And even, I mean, the cameras that we, we're not using the Kinect now anymore, we, you can use all kinds of cameras, even very cheap ones. So they, this is not the big expenses. If you, if you look at all 
all that we need is, is, is in principle quite cheap compared to those meters. So that's not the limitation. There was another question about the cameras as well, and which was already uh, kind of answered by uh, Mahmoud, who was also part of the podium. So it was about the time resolution of the Kinect camera, if this could affect results. And, uh, and Mahmoud clearly answered that, I mean, this is not a limitation. The Kinect can go faster. Uh, can can have more frames per second, but but we are, we, we don't want to we don't want to have information of thirty different times. Of, we, we're not going to simulate thirty times per second the different position of the of the person. They're not moving so fast, so one per second is already enough. And especially for the interventional cases, this is also the timestamp of the RDSR. So I think with that, uh, there was one question on um, uh, contamination. So. I guess this is uh, because I showed this uh, application for nuclear medicine in the beginning. Yes, of course, purely on simulations, you cannot get this information about contamination. But that that is then information that we should try to extract uh, indirectly. So if there is some kind of monitor in the glove box, for instance, and you see that there's a large, or maybe two, and you see that there's a large change in, in their readings, then it could indicate some contamination. So this is something we will try to, we, we didn't solve this yet. This is something for the future, but uh, we would do this uh, through indirect um, estimation. Um, yeah, I think it's about time to finish with 10 minutes uh, after the schedule. Maybe a last question from uh, Mr. Yuto. So how do you expect this podium to practice routine monitoring management five years, 10 years, 15 years later? Anybody wants to answer that? I'm not sure if I understand the question completely. I think, yeah, maybe, maybe it means that when, when do we think we are ready for routine monitoring? Uh, so <laughs> I don't, I don't dare to guess this, whether it's in five years and 10 years or in 15 years. It will it will always be for for some cases where it's it's clear that the the doses are higher where it's okay where the location is appropriate where there are not too many where it's possible to simulate so it will not be for all radiation workers of course that we can apply at the podium but I think in in podium we kind of shown that it is feasible we actually were well I'm not sure if we can say that we were surprised but we were happy with the results we got we really could calculate the doses and and this thing about uh, tracking the workers with the cameras and putting it into the simulation that really works and we really get nice results so uh, for some case and we and it really managed to to make it work in a hospital case this were these two cases that we chosen were not the simplest cases so we really managed to to make it work there so i see there's some other questions coming in but i think we have to end it here um so I would like to end this webinar by thanking the, the three speakers again. I would also like to thank Bob and Kexton for all the work behind this uh, uh, behind the screen. And um, I would like to invite you all for the next webinar, which will be in more or less one month. I think we will announce the, the date in a few days. So um, thank you. Thanks to everybody and see you at the next webinar. <laughs>